Stories of Great Christians. From its radio studios in Chicago, the Moody Bible Institute is bringing you Chapter 16 of the Gypsy Smith biography, From the Forest I Came, based on the Moody Press book by David Lazell, freely adapted for radio by Rex Brenner. In 1906, I made my sixth visit to America. It started with a month's campaign in Boston. Zilla and my wife went with me. The Boston meetings, held at Tremont Temple that seated over 3,000, were crowded twice daily for five solid weeks. Thousands found Christ. Then, after brief missions in Portland, Maine and Manchester, New Hampshire, I journeyed on to Chicago. One remarkable conversion especially stands out in my memory. A woman distinguished by her extreme wealth and of enviable prominence on the Chicago Social Register, called one day at the study of one of the city's well-known pastors. And then, three years ago, I met and married Sid Chancellor. Sid Chancellor? Uh, the same Sid Chancellor that owns the Midwest Steel Mills? The same. Pastor. Eh? I'm merely existing, living in constant fear that my husband Sid will... Well, well, what... Will some way find out about my my past. It's grown to where I don't want to look at him. I'm tortured with guilt. At night I you, you never tried to tell Sid about Tina? Oh no. He'd probably leave me. I love him. I couldn't bear to lose him. And yet I feel I must tell him. My dear Mrs. Chancellor, you said you came to me for counsel. Tell me, do you know Christ as your personal Savior? I'm... I'm not sure. <clears throat> uh, Mrs. Chancellor. Yes? I have a request. You've heard of Gypsy Smith, the evangelist? Heard of him. You probably heard, it's in the papers, that he's conducting an evangelistic campaign at the auditorium. I'd like to request that you and your husband attend... Go to as many of the meetings as possible. I, I'd be glad to do anything that might help. But Mr. Chancellor is out of town. Oh. On business. I see. <clears throat> oh, Mrs. Chancellor, it's unlikely that you're going to know peace of mind nor find true happiness until you resolve your conflict regarding that, uh, that stain on your past that you told me about. Sometimes God allows these things to happen for a purpose, an eternal purpose. Telegraph your husband. Tell him about the Gypsy Smith meetings. Explain that you feel strongly that both you and he should attend. Urge him to come home. Will you do that? I'll, I'll try. Good. I have a feeling that something beautiful may come of it. And in the meantime... I'll be praying. And that prayer was answered. Sid Chancellor came home from the coast and with his wife, Margot, attended our service at the auditorium that Friday evening. I knew nothing of their story at the time, but that night in the inquiry room I spoke to them. As I pled with them, Mrs. Chancellor suddenly burst into tears, gathered her fur piece about her and strode briskly toward the door... Surely the Spirit had led in my selection when, that Sunday, I preached on the topic, The Christ for the Man, the Woman, and the Child. The Chancellors were in the congregation. That evening they dined at home. As Agatha began to clear dessert dishes, Sid followed his wife into the drawing room. Settled comfortably in his deep-cushioned leather chair, he studied Margot as she gazed pensively into the fire. Margot... Dear? Yes? What's wrong? Uh, Sid, I... Uh... Something's been troubling you deeply ever since I arrived from Frisco. What is it? Sid, I... Something I've got to tell you. I've been tormented by this ever since we've been married, and now I... I don't know how you feel about God, your relationship to him. 
but after last Friday night and Gypsy Smith's sermon this morning, I feel I don't want to live. Not without Christ. But Friday night, when Gypsy Smith talked to us, you... I know. I wanted to accept Christ then, but until I told you, talked to you alone, I... Go on. Oh, I felt so unclean for so long. And I couldn't accept Christ with this on my conscience. Last Monday, I had an appointment with a pastor in Chicago. I told him what I have to tell you. Sid, when we were married, I... I was not all I should have been. Not innocent. I... I wondered... I never felt loved at home. And while I was in high school, I... I had a child. Tina. I see. It... It happened the year my parents were in Europe. Remember I mentioned... I remember you told me that once when you were a kid, your father's company sent him to Munich on business. And I was left behind. Bitter. Rejected. Well, I packed my things and went to stay with my girlfriend's parents, the Harpers. That summer, their daughter Cicely and I went up to Bangor, Maine. Stayed with some friends of theirs. The husband is a doctor, and... And he took care of me. She, of Tina, was born the 28th of August. The year you graduated? The year before. She's ten. But, well, where is she now? Didn't your parents... If they'd ever have found out. They disowned me. The Harpers, well, they hated my folks. And Dad swindled him in business. Anyway... Mr. Harper knew someone of influence at the shelter. The orphanage? And through that contact, we were able to get them to take Tina. Uh, but you and uh, Tina's father, didn't the two of you... I'm... I'm not sure who the father was. It happened after a Thanksgiving masquerade party. A group of us had been drinking heavily and we went... Never mind. Besides, I felt she was my responsibility... At first, the Harpers helped with her support. And then my Aunt Meg died, and I received an inheritance. With Mr. Harper's help, I invested the money. Gradually, I've been able to care for her myself. Have you never considered letting them put her out for adoption? Oh, no. She's mine. Of course, she doesn't know me. But when I go there, sometimes I see her on the playground and it tears me up inside I want her to know me as mother want to take her home now you know everything and if you turn me away I'll have no one honey (sighs) Tina has a home at the orphanage no a home here Sid You mean you? I mean I love you, want you, and Tina. But you could forgive. You're forgiven. Forgiven. Freely forgiven. As freely as Christ forgave the woman taken in adultery. After all, I too am guilty, not without sin. I confess I've known indiscretion in my life. But remember... Gypsy quoted it this morning. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a miracle, Sid. A miracle? What Christ can do. Let's kneel right here by the fire and give ourselves to him. (sighs) Yes. I want him too. More than money from the mills. I just want to be free from myself. So do I. Free, the three of us, to serve him together. Three? Tina. (gasps) The very next day, after visiting Tina and laying plans for adoption... 
The Chancellors sought me out at the auditorium, shared with me their story, rejoicing in their newfound life in Christ. My mother, you might recall, passed away when I was but a lad of five. In 1882, my father remarried. When my stepmother learned that I'd be campaigning in Chicago, she said, Now, mind you, my bill must be converted before you leave that town. Her son, who'd made his home in Chicago, attended every one of the meetings, yet wavered when it came to stepping out for Christ. As the final service drew to a close and the invitation was given, I hesitated fully five minutes, pleading, scanning the sea of faces for a glimpse of Bill. Where was he? Friends, I believe there's someone else here in this auditorium tonight who needs the Savior. I... I think I'll tell you his name. Bill. His dear mother back in England, in Cambridge, is praying for him. Every night he's been here and sat through the meeting. Bill, you know Jesus loves you. Died for you. Settle it with him tonight, won't you? Give me the joy when I go home to Cambridge of telling your mother that her prayers have been answered. He's pleading for you, Bill. Oh, Bill, are you out there? Bill! Now there's one more verse of Jesus is calling. Let's, let everyone bow in prayer while I sing. Come on, Bill. Jesus is pleading, oh, listen to his voice. Hear him today, hear him today. They who believe on his name shall be Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling. Sir, I'm that Bill you've been talking about, and, and I want to give my life to Christ. I stared at the boy, amazed. This was not my Bill, not my stepmother's son. But as I was to learn after the benediction, this lad also had a praying mother back in Cambridge, England. Soon, God was to reveal to me his purpose in this coincidence. For the moment, though, we rejoiced with Bill over his newfound saviour. But later that night, wakeful in the silence, I pleaded, Lord, my Bill is not saved, and tomorrow we leave Chicago. The next morning, whipped by a driving rain, we edged our luggage through the doorway of our lodging and were about to climb into a waiting taxi. Suddenly, through the downpour... My Bill appeared, drenched and dripping. He flung his arms about me, sobbing joyfully. I made it! I made it! Before you left. Bill! He... I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Praise the Lord. When did you... When did you come, Bill? I was in the meeting last night, but I was afraid to step out. Afterward, when I got back to my room, I knelt, gave my heart to the Lord. Wonderful. I feel different, new inside. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming to Chicago. And so we conclude Chapter 16 of From the Forest I Came, the story of Gypsy Smith. This is another in the series, Stories of Great Christians, produced by the Department of Broadcasting of the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago.